Good evening. Just after we recorded tonight's edition of Insight, 60 Minutes on CBS aired a powerful segment on their 46th anniversary program, which brought home forcibly the issues we discuss on our show, namely the consequences of mentally ill children as well as adults not receiving adequate or timely treatment, or indeed, not even being properly diagnosed early enough, and the sometimes fatal consequences for our society of those inadequacies. 60 Minutes has given us their permission to broadcast a small segment of that show. Here's Steve Croft. The mass shooting at the Washington Navy Yard two weeks ago that resulted in the deaths of 13 people, including the gunman, was the 23rd such incident in the past seven years. It's becoming harder and harder to ignore the fact that the majority of the people pulling the triggers have turned out to be severely mentally ill, not in control of their faculties, and not receiving treatment. In the words of one of the country's top psychiatrists, these were preventable tragedies, symptoms of a failed mental health system that's prohibited from intervening until a judge determines that someone presents an imminent danger to themselves or others. The consequence is a society that's neglected millions of seriously ill people hidden in plain sight on the streets of our cities or locked away in our prisons and jails. Good evening. My name is Ron Burglass, and this is Insight. Columbine, Aurora, Sandy Hook, names that will be forever branded on our souls as unconscionable crimes committed by young people who many think could have been stopped had they been properly diagnosed and treated before they lost their way and destroyed the lives of so many innocent people and their families. If you're a parent or caregiver, how do you tell the difference between innocent childhood behavior and behavior that needs to be looked at more closely? Is your child behaving strangely? And if so, what does their strange behavior mean? What could possibly be wrong, if anything? And where do you go to find out and then start the process of making it right? At what point do you have to finally admit to yourself that your child really does need help? Tonight, we hope to provide you with some of the answers to those questions, and at the end of the show, we will post a list of people and places you can start with when you come to the point when you have to ask for help. My guests are Dr. William Shearer, Officer Dennis Barnett, Dr. Teresa Frausto, and Michael Shertel. Dr. Shearer is licensed as both a psychologist and marriage, family, and child therapist, specializing in the treatment of child and adolescent anxiety disorders, co-parenting issues, anorexia nervosa, and bulimia. Dr. Teresa Frausto currently serves as the medical director of the Department of Behavioral Health Department of Psychiatry Medical Services. She has worked for San Bernardino County for the past 10 years in the behavioral health outpatient clinics and as clinic medical director for the juvenile detention and assessment centers. She is triple board certified in adult, child, and addiction psychiatry. Michael Shertel has served the adolescent population of the County of San Bernardino as a clinical therapist, clinic supervisor, as program manager, and as the deputy director of regional operations and children's services. And Officer Dennis Barnett is the director of the Fontana Leadership Intervention Program, better known as the FLIP program which was established in 2009 as the Fontana Unified School District began looking for options for interventions for at-risk students. Dr. Shearer. Hello, Ron. Welcome. Let's begin by asking whether there are any specific warning signs that parents can look out for if they suspect their child might be suffering from a mental disorder. Uh, Ron, re recently I've, I found in the journal Pediatrics a, a very handy list uh, that parents could use to identify warning signs, things that they uh, that might alert them to a possible problem. It doesn't mean that necessarily that there is a problem, but things that they might consider and it might prompt them to, to seek additional help. Let me just ask, I'm, I'm sure you don't want parents trying to diagnose their own children, right? No. No, and uh, I mean, there, it, it, these disorders can, there, there are a lot of disorders, possible disorders, and they, they can be very complex, and there's a certain set of criteria that have to be met in diagnosing any particular disorder. It's best done by someone who's well-trained in doing that. Uh, we don't want to cause parents unnecessarily uh, to, to uh, get stressed out and worried that their, their child is autistic or schizophrenic when that may be very far from the case. So um, 
so a parent thinks there might be something wrong? Like, uh, first of all, if, if uh, they notice that their child is feeling sad or withdrawn for more than two weeks, all kids get sad sometimes. They get withdrawn sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if it lingers on and continues on and on, that, that might be a sign that they need to seek additional help. Another warning sign is if uh, a child is seriously trying to harm or, 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 or even kill himself or make threats about killing himself or making plans to do so, very definite warning sign. Uh, if a child is having sudden overwhelming fear for no particular reason, sometimes with a racing heart or, uh, or rapid breathing. Um, I work with kids who are eight and nine years of age having panic attacks. It's not too young to be, to have panic attacks, to have extreme anxiety or depression. And parents can, can notice these kinds of things. Do you know, um, parents hear labels Mm -hmm. tossed around all the time. You hear yeah. ADD, ADHD, um, bipolar, schizophrenia, and they get worried. They mm -hmm. see somebody else's child, they hear about somebody else's child, sure. and they get worried, and they look at their child, and they're not sure. So where do they go to find out? What, what do they do? Well, again, if they notice any of these warning signs, if mm -hmm. things are really out in the ordinary, uh, they, they need to not keep it a secret, often pa parents are in denial and they don't want to admit that their child might have a problem. If they suspect a problem, they need to consult a specialist. They could start with their pediatrician. Uh, they could um, uh, talk to a psychologist, uh, someone who, who is specialized in, in working with the kinds of uh, things I talked about. Um, you, you brought up something just, just now which I thought was very interesting. What if a parent doesn't want to admit to themselves that there's something wrong with their child? What, you yeah. know, in the case of yeah. um, Sandy Hook, that um, that boy lived in the house with, with his mother, and the mother didn't seem to mm -hmm. get him any help, mm -hmm. and, and um, did all the wrong things, it seems, and, mm -hmm. and everybody was made to pay yeah. the price. Yeah. Th th that can be a huge problem. Parents don't want to acknowledge, they, they, don't, they don't want to, they, they don't want to know that their child has a severe problem, maybe a problem that the, may follow them for life. Uh, parents are often in denial. Uh, they often uh, are slow to get help, uh, but like I said before, getting help early is often the key. Is there a genetic link? Is there any kind of genetic link between um, parent and child that might um, have already planted the seed uh, for mental illness? Well, there, there are some things that do run in families, like, like uh, being uh, bipolar or schizophrenic. Uh, it's really important to get a family history. Um, um, even things like uh, anxiety and depression, uh, if there's a history within the family, that, that can be uh, very useful information. Mm -hmm. I understand that there are environmental and there are biological um, causes for mm -hmm. um, mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're talking about now are biological causes in terms of genetic. Is that, mm -hmm. is that right? Yes. So if we're talking about environmental causes, um, I think the one that we hear about most are, are children being damaged because of um, problems that the parents have between each mm -hmm. other. Could mm -hmm. you talk about that a little bit? Parents that are, are have a, a, a really tough time bonding with their child uh, produce children with uh, attachment difficulties. Um, what is that attachment theory, right? Yeah. What uh, does that mean? Yeah, well, a, a child needs to have a secure attachment early in life, uh, primarily with mother, and if that doesn't happen. A uh, child is likely to have trouble with relationships uh, thereafter and trouble with their, their, their sense of self. Does um, it have to be just with the mother? Can it no, it could be, it could be with uh, mother, with father. Um, a lot of the difficulties I see have to do with, with disturbance in the family, uh, with a um, high level of conflict or a high level of neglect. Um, uh, often, the, the, often family issues are at the heart of what the, what the child is experiencing. Do, do you, um, what kind of impact on, on, a children, on a child's mental health, say, does, um, does divorce have on a child, high-conflict divorces? Huge, huge. Even, uh, and I even see that happening with adult children. But uh, with, with, uh, with children of all ages, uh, divorce is a, a really a wrenching event in that child's development. This child is, de is depending upon these two adults for everything, for their sense of security, for, for their sense of well-being. Uh, and when these 
caregivers are not doing well, particularly when they're acting in kind of in crazy ways sometimes, because divorce tends to do that to people. Mm -hmm. uh, that impacts very heavily upon the child. Often the child is uh, finding himself or herself in the middle, you know, having to choose or feeling like uh, a go-between. Uh, it can be very damaging to children. It can also be handled in such a way that, that the damage is minimized. So in a sense, um, one parent might be using the child as a weapon against the other parent. That, that is, unfortunately, that's often the case. I've heard that happens quite frequently yeah. in high conflict divorces. Yeah. Is, there a, is there a term, is there a phrase for that? Is there, is, have, has anybody taken a look at what damage that causes? It's referred to as parental alienation syndrome. Mm -hmm. And now I'd like to welcome Michael Chertel and Dr. Teresa Frausto. Um, Dr. Frausto, could you give me some idea um, of the, or examples of um, the link between mental illness and poverty? As far as mental illness and poverty, mental illness can affect anyone, um, any color, any race, any socioeconomic class. Uh, there is no preference. And, but it does, once someone has mental illness, they may often lose um, the ability to function at higher levels and may lose their jobs. And so there will be a tendency, especially the more severe the mental illness is, to then um, not be able to work and provide for your family. So there is, there can certainly be more mental illness in people who live in poverty. So you have a family, you have a poor family, and they think there might be some mental illness there in their child. They have no insurance. What do they do? Well, it's important to recognize uh, what symptoms can look like or how mental illness can present in children. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, uh, let's say for adolescents, parents might think, or even teachers, uh, that uh, the mental illness, that it's not mental illness, that it's just normal behavior, acting out behavior, they just want attention. Uh, however, it's important to realize that if these symptoms start to affect their level of functioning where they're not receiving the same grades that they did before. So instead of getting A's, they're getting C's, or so, instead of B's, they're getting D's, or they're not sleeping, or they're not eating. But that, you're, you're describing normal teenage behavior to me here. What, what, where's the difference between a teenager who just decides to have a bad year in school and the onset of mental illness? Usually it does continue to go on. It can affect not only their functioning at school, but they can have sleep and appetite changes. There could be a weight gain or weight loss or trouble sleeping or sleeping too much. Uh, those are things that are very much red flags. So this family with no insurance, what do they do? The first uh, thing they could do is certainly talk to their pediatrician or the family doctor and certainly also they can call uh, the county. We have a access number that they can call and ask to be assessed. Mm -hmm. So they can call 211. Mm -hmm. um, we have a relationship with 211 which is uh, available 24 seven and they will link to our clinics. So if the family needed um, an assessment or services or a referral, they could be directed into one of our local clinics or they could be referred to a fee for service provider when a family comes to our programs and they have no insurance, we have a process where we interview them and we'll determine what their share of cost would be, which is based on a system created at a state level. So there may actually be no cost to the family. If that's the case, also we have eligibility workers in our programs that will help them um, apply to Medi-Cal and that would be able then to provide uh, insurances for both regular health care as well as mental health care. Is there any kind of waiting time? Uh, say a family wants to get in there. I've heard that some people have to wait to see the specialists up to a year sometimes. Is that is that right? No, we, we triage cases. So when you come in, we have screening times. And if you call the clinics, they'll tell you what those times are. So you'll come in and you'll be screened. And the, at that time, a clinician will determine the level of urgency. And so your appointment time will be based on how urgent your case is. The more urgent, the sooner you would be seen. The goals for coming in and getting a full assessment would be within two weeks. 
So um, you, get, you would get a full assessment within two weeks? You could, yes. It doesn't matter whether high, you have insurance or not. Right. And at the time of the screening, we would do the UMDAP so you would know that's the universal medical screening process. You would know at that time what your cost would be or if there was no cost. If there were determined that you might qualify for Medi-Cal, we would probably assist you at that time to do the Medi-Cal application. What if there's a cost and they can't pay? We can do fee waivers if we believe that that's urgent, and we have programs that are funded by the Mental Health Service Act where there's no cost to the families. So we would look for the most, um, depending on the level of need, the most appropriate service with the least cost to the family. So a parent comes to you with their child <clears throat> and says they're worried about their child, um, and they have to go through a two-week assessment. So they see you, and then they go home. And the situation continues to progress and possibly go down, go further downhill. It's not like you can give them, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, give them a pill or something that they can take to alleviate the symptoms in the meantime. What can you tell a parent whose child is exhibiting strange behaviors but who hasn't yet been properly diagnosed? What, you could, what can you tell them to do for their child? As part of the assessment, uh, you will uh, look to see what the diagnosis is, but it's also areas of their functioning. <clears throat> Oftentimes, for example, someone might come in who is the very typical, a third grader will come in and be having severe behavioral problems. And the parent is just beside themselves. They've tried everything. And it turns out that, uh, well, they did well up until last year. And when they started school, uh, they, no, they could no longer um, do the schoolwork, and it's because it turns out they have a learning disorder. But it was mild enough that they were able to compensate and make through, make get through for kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. But when third grade hit, it was much too, too difficult. Well, on top of that, um, so, there's, so there's not a pill for necessarily a learning disorder, but there's interventions through the school uh, that will be needed. Then on top of that, well, yes, they might have a depression, but the depression is really dependent on how well they do in school. So that's one example. Another example is they have a learning disorder and they have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is the most common diagnosis that we see in, in children. As a matter of fact, uh, one in five children will have uh, a mental disorder, according to the recent CDC report, um, Center for Disease Control. And, ADHD followed by depression and anxiety, those are the most common symptoms. So they're getting an assessment and they're getting a diagnosis, but they're also getting an assessment on all their other areas of functioning in their life. I've heard often about ADD and ADHD and it's talked about in schools. Do you work closely with schools and with school counselors so that if a school comes to you and says, we've got a child here who may have serious problems, um, will you help them, or does it depend on the district, or what do you tell a, a school, a high school or an elementary school, whoever comes to you and says, we don't know what to do with this child anymore? So that's two parts, and one is as the psychiatrist, as the treating child psychiatrist or the therapist, we will certainly reach out to the schools and help with the uh, teachers develop a plan, a behavioral plan that best would meet the needs, something as simple as having the child sit in front of the class, or maybe getting extra help with um, tutoring during lunch or after school or having them, if they're very anxious, go to the school uh, before anyone else does, different behavioral inter interventions. Uh, and then we also have a systems approach, which Michael can sure. discuss. We have um, contract services. So we have agencies that are private, um, nonprofit agencies that provide on-site services for the school at multiple levels. So we have one uh, level where they train teachers and school staff how to recognize the signs of mental illness so that they can begin early intervention. We have another program, which is really an early intervention counseling program um, that's managed by the same provider where they refer those children in to get some immediate counseling. For those kids who are determined to have more serious concerns or greater need, they can be referred into our children's intensive treatment. Again, the same provider has that same contract, or it's really like a continuum within the school service model. So we're training the teachers. Here's some 
things to look for. If you see these, do this. And then when they're referred into that secondary program, if it's more severe, they can refer on. But we also have numerous other adjunctive services that can be provided in the classrooms. Therapeutic behavioral support services, one. We have wraparound providers who also do wrap services in the schools. For many years, we did most of the seriously um, emotionally disturbed services for the schools up until 2010 when the governor changed that mandate. Now the schools still have an IEP responsibility to provide counseling services for kids, but we will work closely with them to help those kids who might fall through the cracks or those kids who have Medi-Cal that are entitled to services because they have Medi-Cal, we would um, be willing and helpful in serving those children as well. So a counselor can contact mental health services and say, <clears throat> we have a child here who needs more than be. what the school could provide, certainly. And you would be in contact immediately? You would arrange things immediately to, for this child to be seen and assessed? In many of our places, we have um, providers who would already be at that school providing services and would, would accept a handoff of those cases. In fact, you have um, various local organizations all over the county, don't yes. you, that, that help people out. Um, <clears throat> what, what does the county have to provide in total, the kinds of agencies that are that are available to parents at any time to have their children seen? Well, we have a, a fairly broad range of services starting from what we would consider prevention level types of services, such as the school assistant program that I talked about. We have family resource centers where parents can go get parent training, parenting classes, some Because that's early, important, isn't it? Yes, and in many cases when you're dealing with with children who have some um, initial emotional problems, how a parent responds to them will make a big difference. If you tend to deny it or minimize it, you're likely to exacerbate the problem and it'll go on longer. Um, and the longer it goes on, the more difficult it will be to, to uh, remediate. So training parents how to manage kids who have learning disabilities and emotional problems early on will make a huge difference in the success of treatment for that What child. about parents who don't want to cooperate, for whom uh, mental illness is, is, is almost a stigma, um, and they, and they, and they <clears throat> don't want to either admit it um, or take part in any program to help their child that would involve them? What do you do? On an individual basis, so as, if someone is coming in to one of our clinics and seeing one of the psychiatrists or therapists, we really just try to continue to support them and engage them and let them know what the options are. Uh, usually the child is in much distress by the time uh, they get to the clinic that they do want treatment. And it is a lot of education of the parents and helping them with the stigma because there is a lot of stigma involved in getting treatment. But you're talking about a lot of people here. There, I, I, well, I understand that something like uh, Twenty percent of the children in this country who have mental illness are ever seen or assessed. Twenty percent. So can you tell me with any degree of certainty that, that the children of San Bernardino who are suffering from mental um, diseases or illnesses um, can be treated whenever they want, whenever they need, the, the, the facilities are there whenever they need them? I think that uh, it is a challenge uh, nationally to uh, have enough providers to uh, treat the children. But we do have services here in San Bernardino County that is, they can access. Is there a, any kind of central watchdog or control over all those? Because I believe that um, you, you um, subcontract to various nonprofits around the county. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly for our agency, for the, the providers that we contract with, we, we oversee on a several levels. We oversee on a fiscal contract level and we oversee on a program level. We do quarterly evaluations. We're in the clinics uh, at least every, in the programs that are providing contract services at least every three months for children. And we do a very thorough program review on an annual basis for all of them. But it's really, we have much more of a camaraderie, collegial relationship. We know them. Um, we're trusting kids to them. so. Um, we have a really regular meeting. I meet with the uh, providers, contract representatives on a regular basis. We meet on a manager level. We meet at a clinical level where we have staff that work very closely together because many of our services sort of um, are part of a continuum. So one provider will do a part of a service and another provider does another. 
So there's a requirement for a relationship to be on there t so that we can maintain that trust. Of those nonprofits, you, um, I believe I read somewhere that you have eight walk-in clinics around the county, is that right? We have eight county-run walk-in clinics throughout the county from as far away as Needles, with Big Bear, Barstow, um, we have uh, Vista, which is in Fontana. Um, our biggest one, Phoenix, is in San Bernardino, and we have another large one in Upland and another large one in uh, Rialto. Um, and then we have four contract providers who do those. We have a contract provider who does the general mental health services in Morongo Basin, uh, Yucaipa and Redlands. We have one in the West End in the Ontario area. And then we have um, one, I think I mentioned the Big Bear one. So you walk into one of these clinics or contracts and you get what? You would get um, what we call general mental health services would be an assessment um, to determine that you meet the state requirements under Medi-Cal for need. Is, is, when you walk in there, is it one of those take a number jobs and sit down with masses of people and wait for hours until you get seen or is it something much less <clears throat> Well, we personal. try to make them more friendly in that, but I'm sure in some of the clinics, we have some extremely busy clinics. Uh, Phoenix is an extraordinarily busy clinic, and um, there may be some time what we do, I think for children especially, um, work very closely not to have them waiting for hours. Um, but there are some days busier than others. Um, there have been days I've walked into clinics and there was no one there, and I'm wondering, where was everybody? And then there are other days you can hardly work, walk through the waiting room. We also, with children, you see sort of, um, there are times in the school years where you see a lot more kids. So at the beginning of the school year, our children's clinics will receive a lot of referrals. And so it'll be very busy. But that'll slow down around Christmas and then pick up immediately after the Christmas holidays. And then again, towards the end of the school year, you'll see the population bloom and then it'll drop off in summer. So there are specific times where we do see a lot more kids than other times. You know, a parent walks in to a clinic or a provider um, with a worry about <clears throat> their child, and what they want is for their child to be cured. Right. They want success. They don't want their child to be like that. How do you help that parent? And can you, can you let them believe, or uh, accurately let them believe that there will be success? with their child? I know, I know it depends on the kind of mental illness, mental illness that is being presented, but what can you tell the parent when they walk in? Oftentimes when the parent arrives and they finally hear that, okay, my child has a clinical depression or a major depression or ADHD, they're very relieved really? that something is going on with their child and it's not that they're a bad parent because oftentimes if a child is acting out, Others will claim uh, and judge that it's because the parent is a bad parent. And so oftentimes they're very relieved that there is something going on and uh, that there's hope and there's treatment. It's very important to provide hope um, to the families and because there, there is very good treatments. Now, cures is a different story. Um, and I often like to use uh, diabetes and a seizure disorder to, as an example on what mental illnesses because with diabetes and seizure disorders it's chronic, it's long term, it can come and go and that's exactly what we see with, with mental illness as well. When a child comes in and the mental illness presents itself um, accompanied with violence, violent behavior, and the parent can't cope with having that child at home anymore um, or even an older child who might um, suffer the onset of <clears throat> mental illness in their teenage years and it becomes violent. What do you tell the parent and what can you do for the child? There's a couple of options. The first one is that if they're a danger to self and others, we would want them to go to the nearest emergency room. That is considered a psychiatric emergency and they would need to have services immediately. If it's something uh, that maybe they know they'll settle down, but there's a risk that they'll escalate again. We have uh, the uh, crisis uh, community response team, and uh, that is a program that uh, we can send out uh, a clinician to evaluate the child and oftentimes de-escalate um, the child or adult, 
and the whole family and prevent hospitalizations and we have a very good success rate. The schools, uh, anyone can call the schools, the police, um, and, and the families can call. What about the effects of drugs and alcohol on children? How does that affect, affect mental illness? Well, that's uh, a challenge, especially in our county, because uh, we are seeing now uh, second-generation children being exposed to drugs and alcohol. What I mean by that is that babies are being born with exposure uh, to drugs and alcohol. Uh, in the past, maybe someone used one type of substance. Maybe they were only drinking alcohol or only smoking cigarettes or only uh, using marijuana. Now we don't see that. It's the whole uh, uh, combination of all the drugs together. So it's not really just one. And particularly uh, in San Bernardino County, we see quite a bit of crystal meth. And those children have significant behavior problems, emotional problems, learning problems. Regulating their emotions is quite the challenge. And they may look like they have attention deficit disorder. They may look like they have depression. They may look like they have bipolar disorder. And it's really very, very different. It's, it's not the, the standard treatments that we have don't work with them. And it takes a village and, and all of our resources to help with the more severe cases on how to manage. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you just have to admit that there's nothing you can do, or do you always feel there's something you can do for that child? Oh, I believe there's always, always hope for, for children. They're still growing and you have development uh, on, their si on our side for, for them to get What better. about if you can't send them home? What about if it's just no good to send them home? Where do they go? I understand you have from <clears throat> a Healthy Homes program, for instance. Is that part of your program? Well, Healthy Homes is actually an assessment program where we work with foster care to assess kids who are coming into custody. Children who can't go home is a more complex issue. Um, we are not a placement agency, so we have no right or ability to place a child out of home. Who does? Child Family Services, probation, So would you go schools. to them if you found a child yes. like that? Would you call Child Family yes. Services and say, look, we, there's a limit to what we can do here? Yes. And, and it happens on occasion. We'd rather treat them in, a, in their home in a less restrictive envir environment. We have um, what we call therapeutic behavioral support, which is 24 hours, seven day a week, in-home support service. I was going to ask you about that, yes. Yeah, so that can go to the house, it can go to the school, it can follow the kid around, they can intervene with the kid. Is this like an officer or? Um, no, it is a um, trained behavior specialist. Who actually accompanies yes. the child 24-7? Yes. Can if that's what's necessary. That's a possibility. In most cases what you find is they identify where the child has the most problems. So they're most likely to have the problem in school, they would work with them at school. If they were most likely to have the problem at home, then they would work out with the family when it would be most appropriate to be in the home. They're also available for callback if there's an emergency or crisis. Another program similar to that is our wraparound program. So we can also do a very similar kind of thing where we work very closely with the parent and the social worker and the schools to develop plans of how you're going to intervene when there are particular problems that might exacerbate or demonstrate that child's needs. So the, the, those moments where they're at greatest risk, maybe when they're most frustrated with schoolwork, maybe when there's a particular peer kind of relationship they're having problems with, or a sibling relationship, you can plan your interventions around the needs of the child and the family. When you see there's a relationship um, within the family where you have this child suffering from a mental illness and parents who cannot <clears throat> cope. Do you ever remove the child from the home? Do you ever um, do you use group homes, anything like that? Well, that would be, once again, a placement agency like Child Family Services, and we would then work very closely with Child Family Services to do whatever was possible to minimize the disruption in the family. Child Family Services in this county has really worked very closely to not have to um, undo families or do something with a child unless it was absolutely at the um, necessary level where somebody was at risk of being hurt. Um, we would much rather intervene and provide services and they are an excellent partner for us in doing that, similar to our relationship with probation as well.
exactly what I wanted to ask you about. How closely do you work with the Juvenile Justice Department? Do you have programs within the jails? I'll let Dr. France do because she worked in our program in the jail for a okay. long time. Yes, uh, it was quite surprising <clears throat> when I first uh, went to work at Juvenile Hall, how many uh, mentally ill adolescents we had there. It was, it was very surprising. Um, oftentimes these are adolescents and sometimes young children, like as young as 10 or 11. Uh, that was rare, fortunately. Uh, but th these adolescents uh, who had mental illness and were in juvenile hall had gone through all these other systems that Michael has discussed. So all those interventions were tried and yet uh, because of uh, circumstances, because of their mental illness, oftentimes they would end up incarcerated. So in the uh, juvenile halls for San Bernardino County, we have services to do assessments. Uh, we see uh, and assess every single adolescent that gets incarcerated um, and from there decide whether they um, need further psychiatric treatment when they're incarcerated or if they need to be referred out. And uh, oftentimes we will also work with the clinics if they're following, if they have a psychiatrist in the clinic or a therapist that we will also communicate with them so that there's a continuity of care. So before they go to jail, they're in school, they finish school, there's nothing for them to do afterwards. Have you got any kind of programs <coughs> in San Bernardino County for kids who are at risk, who, who, kids who present men, as mentally ill? Have you got any pr after school programs? They go to school, they try to function in school, they come out. Have you got any programs for them once they leave school? We have extensive transitional age youth programs throughout the county, and we call them that. They're called the Tay programs. And they're in San Bernardino, for example, there's a large drop-in center. There's another one in Rancho and then in the two deserts as well. And they are places for kids who have sort of either emancipated themselves or are now over 18, many of whom were system-related kids. So they at one time might have been a foster child or might have been a ward. So they can receive all kinds of services, housing referrals, education support services, mental health services. If they're on probation, we have probation officers who work out of the centers. There's washer and dryers. If they need to do their clothes, they can come in and wash their clothes or take a shower. There's recreational uh, centers assigned to them, so if they just want to hang out with other kids who have similar issues, then they're welcome to do that. In the city of San Bernardino, we have a very unique center that's opened in March of this year, and we call it the STAY. And it is a voluntary placement for 18 to 26 year olds who find themselves homeless or at risk of being homeless, who uh, maybe are at risk of being incarcerated but they haven't quite done anything or they're at risk of hospitalization because maybe they're pre-suicidal or close to feeling suicidal. They can voluntarily place themselves in this facility for several months. During that time, we provide stabilization services, counseling services. We link them with our transitional age youth programs so that we can find them housing when they're ready to leave. If they need job preparation or job training, we'll provide that. So it's a fairly extensive program. Um, and that's, once again, for any, anyone. So there's no cost to the person going in. If they don't have Medi-Cal, but they might qualify for Medi-Cal, we'll set them up with an eligibility worker. If there's a possibility they might qualify for Social Security because they have a profound disability, we'll assist them with that. So it's a fairly, I think, strong continuum of services for the kids. Um, we also provide now extensive mentoring for um, form former foster youth or wards. So we have had contract agencies who've created programs where they hire former foster youth or former wards, train them to be mentors. And now they're serving as advocates for these foster youth before they leave the system, helping them prepare for what's going to happen when they turn 18. And they also work with the foster parent to help them understand what it's like for foster kids. So I think our transitional age youth programs are much stronger than they used to be before the Mental Health Service Act came along. Um, there are probably kids who slip through. We'd like to catch them all. But... This is a very transient population as well. We have lots of kids moving in from other counties. Um, it's very difficult sometimes to reach them. Um, 
So we do a lot of outreach services through the colleges and stuff to get their attention, let them know we're here. Thank you, both of you, for coming in. Thank, Thank you. you. At this point, I would like to introduce Officer Dennis Barnett of the Fontana Unified School Police Department. Officer Barnett, welcome. Thank you for having me. You run the FLIP program, is that correct? Yes, sir. What is the FLIP program? Well, the FLIP program is a 16-week intervention program uh, for at-risk teens, and it's run through the Fontana Unified School District in conjunction with the Fontana School Police Department and the Fontana Police Department. So how do you get these kids? Well, we get our kids in a number of different ways. You'd be surprised. Um, one of the ways we get them is through court. Uh, they've been arrested. They may have been sent to juvenile hall. They see a judge, and part of his sentencing, he will mandate that the child uh, participate in the program. We get our kids through probation, as through their probation officer will mandate that they complete the program. But we also get our kids through our school district through child welfare and attendance, through issues with pre-expulsion for behavior, expulsion cases, but also students that are under what we call uh, truancy issues, SARB issues. Also, we get our kids referred to us by parents, uh, concerned parents. They're having issues with their children at home, uh, maybe teachers at a school site, an administrator, school nurses. Sometimes we'll even refer kids to our program. Didn't, didn't this program win an award recently? Absolutely, yeah, we just won what was called the Magna Award, which was for a superintendent's award. But our biggest award that we've been in our, and when I say awards, when we talk about the program winning awards, it's not me get, or uh, the other instructors getting these awards, it's the kids that are receiving this. It's the changes that the kids make in the program. And they were recognized by the IACP, which is the International Association for Chiefs of Police. It's a national award. Worldwide, the program received uh, recognition for really doing something different for law enforcement in order to be able to battle juveniles that are, to help juveniles actually, to battle crime and to be able to get them in an intervention program to try and change their behaviors. You know, the, the kids that take part in this program, Mr. Chertel, would you classify them, and I know this is a, a, a very generalized question because you're not familiar with this, the, the kids involved per se, but the, the, the behaviors that they, that they present, the violence, gang banging, drugs, would you classify that as mental illness? Well, without having met the kids, <clears throat> I don't know that the, the sheer fact that they're in participation or, or in the program suggests they have mental illness. But we certainly recognize that mental illness is a major component um, in juvenile de delinquent type behaviors. A lot of mental illness is represented in adjustment problems. Kids who have difficulties um, learning and staying focused in school because of attention deficit disorders or anxiety related disorders. Kids who've suffered major losses, perhaps their fathers have left or died. Mm -hmm. Um, kids who've had major disruptions or trauma in their lives certainly manifest the kind of behavior that he's mm -hmm. talking Absolutely. about. Do you, um, know, do you know of any other programs in the county um, like FLIP? Um, no, I'm familiar with FLIP, but I don't know of another, others like that. And I believe that some of the other police departments have emulated or tried to get their kids into his program. So my question is, uh, if that's the case, and I, and I trust Mr. Chertel does know what he's talking about, that's why right. why does your program work and why haven't others worked? Well, I think you have, it's not that they haven't worked. I think what you see is a budgetary issue where FLIP is a nonprofit. It is not costing the district one cent to run the program, which is unique to the program, but it's multifaceted. We have a buy-in from the school district. So we have the educational side being taken care of as well as we have the side of which, which most would see as law enforcement taking care of the attitude and behavior. But we're following these kids throughout the week. We're, we're immersed in their lives. We're taking and we're going to their house every week randomly, checking on them at home, going to their schools randomly throughout the week and checking with them at home. They're coming to Wednesday night tutoring sessions, so we see improvement in grades. But we're also making sure that the parents, which is a big and, and important issue, that the parents are mandated to attend an eight-week parenting class, the parenting project. And that starts to build a relationship. And you have a change that the child is, you're, you're asking the child to make a change. 
Is it time for you to change your attitude and behavior? Yes, it is. Okay, well then how then are we going to get the child to be able to change when we don't have a buy-in from the parent? And once you see that there's a connection between the two, it's we're going to stop fighting. It's not fear-based anymore. It's the fact that we respect one another and when we have communication with one another as a parent and a child, we see magnificent things happen at home. And that carries over to school and relationships they have with friends and their peers. It's, it's, it's the totality, I think, of the program that has helped it be able to be successful. What happens if it doesn't work with the child? Do you consult with mental health services? Do you, are you in contact with them? Do you well, work you know, together with them? For some, of, for some of our kids, we go through a process. It's, a, it's an intake interview. And we sit down with the child and we ask them, you know, is this your time to change? Is, is this what you want? And some of them will say, you know what, no thank you. If that's the case, uh, we will go ahead and work with school administration because some of them don't present anything that uh, makes us aware that they may have any issues that we need to refer them to a doctor. But if we do see those behaviors, if we do see something that is alarming to us, um, we use our school psychologist, that's our first basis to be able to make and see whether those kids have specifically been tested in the district or not. And then based on that, the school psychologist then can make a, a very a, a clinical uh, diagnosis whether they believe they should be um, seen by a doctor that would be able to help them with those sorts of uh, situations. So Mr. Chartel, this is a program that wouldn't cost or doesn't cost the county anything. Um, and yet it seems to be extremely effective. You have a, a, a high success rate, I imagine? Yeah, it's about 85% of our kids, and the last uh, statistics that we did, 85% of the kids that are in FLIP that graduate <coughs> will not offend at school again. We don't see them getting c cite citations. They're not back in court. They're not back in the office. Uh, those that do not complete the program, let's be clear on this, I never turn my children away. If they come back to me and say, I need the help, always let them come back in. We have kids right now in our current class that have graduated and are just coming back in because they want to have follow-up and they're looking now for leadership skills. Wouldn't it be possible to set up more of these programs? Well, keep in mind there are over 30 school districts in the county of San Bernardino, each with their own sort of individual ways of responding to these. Probation also has programs, the Gateway Program, Reintegration mm -hmm. Program, and Info Program that serve some of the same mm -hmm. kids. And the goals are the same, um, stop recidivism, find where the children will benefit from treatment, and work on the behavioral-based issues. So I think Fontana has created a unique program that really suits the needs and the purposes of their school district. But I think each school district and each school board is going to make the decision for themselves how best to invest their resources. But I'm sure every school district <clears throat> has the same problem with kids. And I um, suspect most school districts also have some sort of program, whether it's been as successful, um, whether it integrates the, the police agencies as successful. And that, I think that's the thing. toughest thing, why Fontana is unique. You, Fontana has its own school police department. And so th just that alone, that asset of having your own school police department really does make the, the, the program um, be able to function as it does. And then there's the buy-in from the city and the buy-in from Fontana PD and, <clears throat> and making sure that we're working together. Um, but it, and it is a new concept. The, you know, the, even the concept of school policing is relatively, it's not new, but the way that we are, law enforcement is dealing with kids is relatively new. And um, for most of our kids, um, we talk about kids that have had uh, violent backgrounds uh, growing up in, in families where violence is, you know, and, and their contacts with law enforcement have been very negative. Programs like this, when we talk about community uh, policing, they build the relationships with these juveniles. Sometimes the first positive contact these children have with law enforcement is the time they come and sit down with us in the office and go through this program. So it's, it, these, these programs are new. These concepts that we talk about with, with these type of programs are new. And they're exciting because I do think that there is a benefit uh, for every school district to look into programs like this. And hopefully once they <coughs> see this program, they'll, they'll do that. 
You probably just need to find a way to outreach your concept maybe to Children's Network has an annual conference you could present and that would expose it to education and child welfare services and other people so they could find out about it. Absolutely. Thank you both very much. Thank you. And on that note, I would like to say thank you to our guests and to you for tuning in to our very first show. My name is Ron Berglas and you've been watching Insight. <laughs>